Amen. You may be seated. And open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Glory to God. And as you're doing that, I'd like to draw your attention to the screens as we introduce this message. questions that were asked there. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why does God let me hurt? Some ask, why is life so hard? Today we're going to answer these, some of these questions and get a godly perspective on what's really going on in our lives and in the world around us. And so let's start here in Mark chapter 4. In verse 14, if you have a red letter edition, you can see that Jesus is speaking. It says, the sower soweth the word. I mean, oh, the word is powerful. Amen. Amen. Words by themselves, not words that we speak are powerful. God's word is all powerful. It's the power of God to healing, deliverance, protection, whatever you need in this life. Well, verse 15 says, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, what's the name there? Amen. Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with what? Gladness. With gladness. So they hear the word of God and they accept it as truth and they're glad about it. And have no root in themselves. And so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction, of course, we know the word affliction, it refers to just negative circumstances. You know, it could be sickness, disease, financial problems, family problems, uh, whatever type of circumstance that, that the enemy may send against you, or persecution. And we know persecution just refers to people standing against you or coming against you because of what you believe. Ariseth, get this, for the word's sake. Now, I want you to notice something. If God is the one that sent the word to you so it could produce in your life, then God's not going to at the same time send affliction and persecution against you so the word won't work. Amen. Anybody with me here? Anybody understand that? Does that make sense? However, immediately they are, what's that word there? Offended. The word offended there, the Amplified Bible says it this way, they are indignant, they are resentful. Usually when you resent something, you really resent, you, you have an issue with somebody. And so many times uh, what happens when we even as believers find ourselves in situations where we've received the word and then bad things start happening, we actually begin to get offended at God. And it causes the word to not produce in our lives. You know, we live in a world where terrible things are happening every day to people all over the world. And we, we could talk about natural disasters. Uh, you know, we, 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 we turn the television on. We see commercials about little children in Africa who, who are dying from hunger. Uh, we, we could talk about murder. We could talk about uh, so many terrible things going on. And, and for many of us, we've experienced some terrible things. Some of us have lost children. 
Some of us have had people abuse us. Some have been raped. Some have had uh, financial ruin. Uh, many of us have experienced some pretty terrible things. And there is a tendency among believers and non-believers to immediately blame God for whatever is happening in their life or what's happening in the world. And I remember a couple of years ago watching an episode of Larry King Live. And one of the guests was one of the women who, were, who was on the television show, The View. I won't say which one. I'm not trying to call somebody out. But uh, somehow or another, the topic got around to God, and this woman just went on a rant. Well, if God was real, if God was so good, then why are there hurricanes? And why are there children dying? And why are there this? And why? I mean, she just went off. And, and she was illustrating what I'm talking about today. She looked at all the ills of the world and decided it was all God's fault. And, and here's the key. Because she felt like it was God's fault, there was no way she was going to receive him, love him, serve him, and we know be blessed or used by him. And that's the problem with blaming God is that when, when we blame God for what's going on in our lives, all of a sudden we choose to take a step away from God. And we miss out on what he really wants us to have and what we want to have in our lives. Well, what I want to talk to you about today is a master key to you having the kind of walk with God you should have. It's a master key to you walking by faith in God. It's a master key to having the God kind of, resu kind of results that you want to have in your life because if, if, as, long, if, if you, as long as you blame God for negative things happening, you're not going to walk as closely with God as you should. You're not going to believe him to work in this situation if you blame him for failing in the last situation. And you're not going to have the word work in your life if you're, you're, you don't believe in the love of the person who gave you the word. And so the title of my message today is don't blame God. So my turn neighbor and tell them, don't blame God. Don't turn somebody else and tell them, don't blame God. Don't Go with me to John chapter 10. If you want to experience the future God has for you, you're going to have to get settle this issue once and for all. And that's what we're here to do today. Once and for all, settle this issue in your heart and hopefully equip you to help settle this issue in the lives of other people you come in contact with. That's going to help them to be able to see the truth about Jesus and live the life God has for them. Plus, I'll just tell you, as a, as a son of God, I am tired of folk blaming my daddy. Don't blame my daddy anymore. Oh, glory. Come on, let me, come on, John chapter 10. Verse 10. Of course, if you have a red letter edition, Jesus is speaking once again. And uh, verse 10 begins, the thief. Now, of course, notice that, you know, some say, well, he's talking about false religion. Others say he's talking about this, that, and this. But the, 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 the enemy, who's he talking about? The devil is who he's talking about. And, if you, and, and the devil's the one behind false religion. He's the one behind all these things that are anti-Christ and anti-God. And notice the title that Jesus uses this time when describing him. He describes him as a thief. I mean, you know, a thief isn't a good thing. Amen. It's not a good thing, right? Amen. The thief cometh not but for two. Now, we don't say it that way today. We don't say to keep thief cometh not, not but for two. We say he comes only. The only reason why he's coming. To steal. Well, he's a thief. First thing he's doing, he's coming to steal from you. He's coming to steal from believers. And what does he want to steal from, from us? Well, he wants to steal your health. He wants to steal your peace of mind. He wants to steal your money. Right? He wants to steal your children. He wants to take whatever he can get his hands on from you. That doesn't sound good to me. That sounds like evil. In fact, let me clue you in a little bit to, to something we're going to talk about, uh, to, to something about, as we talk about this today. God, if you were to add an O, you get what? Good. Come on, are you with me here? It's 11 o'clock, y'all not sleepy. 
unless you was out clubbing last night, and you really need to pay attention. <laughs> Evil, add a D, what do you get? So if it's good, it's from? God. If it's evil, it's from the? Amen. Come on. The thief comes only to steal. But now he doesn't want to take from you what is yours. He comes to kill. He wants to end your life. In John chapter 8, Jesus was speaking to a number of individuals. He said to them, you are of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he was. I mean, we know about the story of Cain and Abel. It's the enemy that used Cain to kill Abel. And we go all through our time. And in fact, if you were to just think about it for a moment, if it wasn't for the devil, no man would ever have died. Because Adam wasn't created to die physically. He would still be alive. We were created to live forever in these bodies like Jesus will now. But when the enemy got involved in things and he deceived Eve and Adam fell for what he was trying to do, then the enemy was able to cause death to reign over all the earth. And now he has been causing murder. He's been committing murder ever since. He comes to kill. I remember pastoring in our church in Georgia, and, and, and I remember one couple we had, great couple, wonderful couple. They finally had a baby, and then that baby died a few months into his life. Well, God didn't do that. The devil did that. You know, sometimes when, when people pass away, you know, we say, well, the Lord needed another piano player in heaven. Come on now. We're going to talk about this. I know it's an apologetic type message, but we're going to talk about this today. Because we got to get rid of this mess. Because part of the problem that we have as believers is even those of us who know better, when you get in the pressure cooker and things are tough and you almost feel like you can't take anymore, there is this tendency to say, well, God, I, I love you. I'm one of your children. I've been serving you. I've been giving my time. Why did you let this happen when God had nothing to do with it? So we need to settle this. Yeah, so, you know, um, like I said, you see that case where, 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 you know, somebody dies and people say, well, you know, the Lord needed them in heaven. Need another voice in the choir. <laughs> well, that, that's, the Lord didn't kill them early. He wasn't behind that. But Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Job said a whole bunch of other stuff, too, that wasn't right. Everything in the Bible is truth, but not everything said by a Bible character is true. God is telling us a story. And if you study what was happening with mankind, you'll find that they were doing that. You find something called progressive revelation. In other words, as mankind continued to walk with God over the years and the decades and the and on and on and on, we gain more and more understanding about God and how we're supposed to walk with God. So God wasn't angry with Job because that's all he really knew at that time. And his heart was right. But we ought to know better. Because Jesus said, when it comes to killing people, that's the devil's work. Not only that, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill. Get this, and to destroy. Destroy. I mean, he, he doesn't just want your body. He wants, to, he wants your soul. Remember what Jesus said to Peter? He said, Satan desires to have you that he may sift you as we. What did Satan want? Satan wanted Peter's soul. See, he already knows that he's going to spend eternity burning in a lake of fire for what he did. And he wants to take as many of us with him that he can. Misery loves company. And, and, and this is not just true of Christians. This is true of everybody. Satan hates people. Why? Because Satan didn't get a second chance. Come on. He messed up one time. 
and he's done for eternity. God, God gave us chance after chance after chance after chance. Anybody glad you've had a second chance, third chance, fourth chance? Not only that, Satan, what Satan wanted was to be like God. And then God turned around and made us like God. He hates mankind, and he wants, uh, he wants us burning in hell forever with him. He's the source of the evil in this world. I see some of you still, still need some convincing, so come on. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Let's walk through some more scripture on this. I need, I need to hear myself a little bit better, Sam. Ephesians chapter 6. God, good. Devil, evil. If it's good, it's from God. If it's evil, yep, it's the devil. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. You know, I start to understand the scriptures like, you know, John 17, when Jesus was praying for the apostles, and he, he knew he was leaving. He said, Father, you know, there was evil in the world. He said, protect them from the evil. Why would he ask God to protect them from the evil if he were doing the evil? You know, he said about them and, and, and those of us who have authority over the enemy. He says, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Sounds like what he's saying is because the enemy is dealt with, now you are free from evil in your life. But if God were the cause of the evil, then wouldn't I still be in a position to be impacted by evil? Defeated? You look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the strategies of the who? Devil. Of the devil. Let, let me say something else while, while we're going through this. You know, a man once said, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was getting the world to believe he didn't exist. And, and I noticed this. I, I remember a couple years ago when, when September 11th happened. You know, I love sports. So I was on a forum, you know, online, and, I, and, and, they, and they were talking about 9-11, and, and people were railing against God, and why did God allow this to happen, on and on and on. And so I responded, you know, John 10, 10, and this wasn't God, this was the devil, and, you know, trying to witness to somebody, even on that type of forum. And, uh, and, and, of course, what happened was, first of all, the forum wouldn't even let me type the word devil. And then second of all, they still were able to figure out what I was saying. And they said, oh, why are you getting all superstitious? And I'm like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We were just talking about God. So, I mean, if it's superstitious, then what were you doing talking about God? Okay, but why can't we talk about God but not talk about the devil? You know, I've been reading a lot of Christian books and teachings and a lot of good stuff that that God that has used individuals to write. Uh, but, you know, one of the things I've noticed, like there's one I'm reading now, it's really, it's got some good stuff in it, it's got some not so good stuff in it. And I, one of the things that bothers me, when it talks about testing trials and difficulties, it never once mentions the devil. Amen. It's all God's taking you through this so that you can, you know, grow in character and all that. But, but, but what about the guy that's actually pointing the gun? So what, what's happened is we got the wrong guy on trial. We got God up on the stand, and we're, we're trying him for what he is supposedly doing in our lives while the real murderer is out here running loose. There is a madman on the loose, a serial killer who's stealing, killing, and destroying, and we're shaking our fist at God. Instead of recognizing, oh, that's the enemy, and now let me use my authority to stump him under my feet. Well, he says here, put on the whole armor of God. Notice again, God's telling you, hey, this is what you need to do to be protected from evil. That you can stand against these things. Verse 12 says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What's he talking about? We're wrestling against demon spirits. There's a battle going on in the realm of the spirit here in the earth between good and evil. God and the devil. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. What's that? A day of attack. 
And having done all to stand, stand therefore, and jump down to verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the, who's he talking about when he talks about the wicked? The devil. So notice the devil is the one that fires darts into your life. He's the one that forms weapons against you that will have told that they can prosper, they can destroy you. God's the one telling you to put the armor on and use your shield so you can be protected. God good, devil evil. Go with me if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Don't blame God. Whatever you're going through, whatever happened to you, whatever's going on right now, whatever the enemy sins against you in the future, don't blame God. Don't fall for that trick. The Bible says Satan is a great deceiver. That's what he does. And he has deceived so many. He deceived, you know, uh, the people of America into calling everything bad of God, blaming God for what's happening in the world. God has nothing to do with it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now here in 2 Corinthians 12, we read about Paul's thorn in the flesh. And so many of us have heard about Paul's thorn in the flesh and how it was given to him by God, how it was sickness and disease to keep him humble. But what does the Bible actually say? Verse 7, unless I should be exalted above measure, the revelation will increase you. Through the abundance of the revelations that was given unto me, didn't say that was given to me by God. Notice that. You won't even find God mentioned in this scripture. A thorn in the flesh, comma, now he's going to tell you what it is. The messenger of who? Satan. Of Satan to buffet me. The word messenger there means, is, is the, it comes from the Greek word angelos, which is the word we get angel from. So there was a demon spirit assigned to Paul by Satan. To try to keep, to keep buffeting him, hitting him, trying to keep him from going higher in God and ultimately reaching more people for God. And so then when you read about the things that happened to Paul, I mean, you read about Paul being beaten, Paul being stoned, Paul being shipwrecked. Paul went through a lot of things. Some things he didn't have to, but he didn't learn that until later on in his walk. That's part of what this chapter is about. Paul, Paul was, he went through a lot of difficulty, and it wasn't God that did that to him. It was the devil that did that to him because he didn't want him to get more revelation. He didn't want him to get the word of God to more people so that they would miss hell and go to heaven. Notice again, the devil did it. God good, devil evil. So don't blame God. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. That's why you have scriptures in the Bible like, hey, if you dwell in a secret place of the Most High, you abide under the shadow of the Almighty, well, no evil will befall you. Amen. A thousand may fall by your side, ten thousand by your right hand. It will not come near you. You don't have to be afraid of the sicknesses. You don't have to be afraid of the gunshots. You don't have to be afraid of any of that stuff because you're under God's protection. Well, notice God's the one protecting you, not sending those things at you to teach you something, to develop your character, or any of those other things. Because you have to understand, all of these attacks of the enemy are designed to take you out. And there are many people who are being taken out. God's not behind it. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. God is actually the one warning us. It says, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, notice you have an adversary, an enemy. It's not just the enemy of God. He's your enemy. Yes, your adversary, the devil, the devil, the devil, yeah. not God, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So I want you to notice the devil is going through the earth devouring people. He's taking people out. And God is telling us what we need to do so that we're one of those that he cannot devour. Well, once again, God's got this very, he's got this figured out. We all too as well. God good, devil evil. Go with me to Mark chapter 12. You understand, there was no evil in the world until the devil showed up. Right? Genesis, there was no evil. And, and when the devil is gone, there won't be any evil then. 
You go back, to, you go to the book of Revelation, you find out he's gone. We have a thousand years of, of paradise. Then he's released for a season, the Bible says, and you have evil all over again. Then he's dealt with once and for all, and we have no more evil. Well, it's pretty clear who's behind all of this then. See, it is dangerous to say that a good God does evil to his people. It does evil to people, period. Once again, that causes people to push away from God, to not want to receive him, to not want to walk with him, to not be able to receive from him when they need protection and they need healing and they need God to comfort them. It causes things to be turned upside down. Something else it does is that it takes all the responsibility for negative things happening in our lives out of our hands. Because sometimes we messed up. Because we messed up, that's why how the devil got in. Oh, come on, don't look at me like that. You know, some guy messing around with some girl and she gets pregnant and then, then they say, oh, the Lord just must have wanted this child here. Well, thank God God's going to make something wonderful out of that mistake, that sin. But don't blame that on God. Now, the devil has something to do with that, obviously, but you know, ultimately, you made the decision. But if we're going to take every negative situation and then say, well, it was God, and all of a sudden, we had nothing to do with it. And that's just contrary to the word of God. The way this world works is seed time and harvest, meaning you are the one that makes a decision, and then there are consequences based on your decisions. There are no accidents in this world, no coincidences. So saying God, is, as a good God does evil, he's the one that calls these things, takes the responsibility out of, your, out, of, out of our hands for our actions. Of course, it also takes responsibility out of the devil's hands. It puts everything on God and blames him for everything. And no wonder people don't want to serve him. Now, I hear some people saying, well, okay, but what about uh, all those Old Testament scriptures that seem to read like you know, the Lord will cause this sickness and disease to be on you. The Lord will lay this on you. In fact, there's one scripture in Isaiah 45 where it says, you know, God created good and then he created evil. Well, let me, let me read a scripture. Let me read something to you from uh, one of Kenneth Hagin's books called The Key to Scriptural Healing. He says, Dr. Robert Young, the author of Young's Analytical Concordance to the Bible, and an outstanding Hebrew scholar, points this out in his book, hints, and helps to Bible interpretation. Although this book is no longer in print, he says, I made notes from it many years ago. And Dr. Young says that in Exodus 15, 26, which is a scripture that seems to say the Lord will lay sickness on you, that the literal Hebrew reads, I will permit to be put upon thee none of the diseases which I have permitted to be brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. He goes on to talk about the plagues that came across Egypt. He says, the plague of death that came upon Egypt did not come until God withdrew his hand of protection and permitted it. His permission, however, should not be confused with commission. God permits people to establish bars and nightclubs. He permits people to, to steal and kill, but he certainly doesn't commission it. There is a vast difference between permission and commission. He goes on to say, the key to these difficulties lies in the fact that the active verb in the Hebrew has been translated in the causative sense when it should have been translated in the permissive sense. Here's the bottom line. What you hold in your hand as a, 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 most of us in this room as an English speaking, English reading person is a translation. This is one of the reasons why you see Bishop and myself and others will, will go back and study what the original Greek and Hebrew said and tell you what the meaning is because from time to time the translators will make a mistake. And it's my personal opinion, the biggest translation error they made was going throughout the Old Testament and taking the scriptures where the Bible said the Lord will permit these things to come on you and then translating it as though it said the Lord will put these things on you. Amen. Well, that's not what the original Bible said. That's what the translators put here. God does not cause evil to come into your life, but he does permit evil to be in the world. Why? Go to Mark chapter 12. Don't blame God. This is a case of mistaken identity. 
So we're going to clear this up today. Playing detective today. Mark chapter 12, verse 1. Let's, let's go back and uh, some earth history right now. I know many of you may know this. If you do and you're mature, you'll give the more earnest heed to the things that you've heard. And those who don't, you want to pay attention even as well. It says, and he began to speak to them by parables. Of course, he's talking to the chief priests and scribes and elders who are ultimately confronting him. In fact, they're the ones eventually that are, that are sentence him to death. And so he's talking to him about some things. And he, it says in the parable that he gave, which is just a story with a spiritual, spiritual truth in it, a certain man planted a vineyard. Well, that man is God the Father. We're going to see that in a moment. And set a hedge about it and dig the place for the wine vat and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. Well, if we were to keep reading with this story, he talks about how when the time came where that vineyard should be producing fruit, he sends a servant back. But those husbandmen beat that servant. And he sends another one, and they kill that servant. And this was a this routine for a while. Finally, he sends his son, and they kill his son. Does that sound familiar? So let me go back to what I said. The man in this parable represents God. The vineyard that he planted represents planet Earth. In fact, you even find scriptures where the Bible says God planted a garden in Eden. All right. Uh, you'll notice that he digged a place for the wine vat and because, you know, he told Adam, be fruitful and multiply. Dress the garden. In other words, he, he, he created the planet, gave it to man and expected man to take what God had put in the earth and be fruitful with it. In so many different ways. He, he built a tower. Well, he also told Adam to protect the garden, didn't he? And notice this. And he let it out. To husbandmen. If you look this phrase up, it just simply means to lease. To lease. So God owns the earth. The Bible says that very clearly. But what he did when he created the planet was he then leased it out to man. He gave man the lease. That's why he said to Adam, I'm giving you dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the earth, over all the earth. I want you to subdue the earth. Now think about this. If I were to lease you my house, okay, and then, you know, you wake up one day, you haven't had a chance to clean up at all. You're looking kind of rough. Somebody said, I wouldn't look rough. Or you, didn't, you missed the message last week on meekness and humility. So, <laughs> no, I'm just messing with you. I mean, in other words, you don't want anybody to see you. You come stumbling in the kitchen, and I'm sitting there over a plate of pancakes from your refrigerator, drinking your orange juice, saying, hey, good morning. You wouldn't be too happy to see me. In fact, legally, you could call the police on me, couldn't you? And I might say, but I own it. Yeah, but the minute I leased it to you, I lost my rights to operate in this space. Whatever happens in this space is now up to you. When God created planet Earth, he created it for mankind. When he, he, he created it, he leased it to man, and then he rested. He's planning to be a spectator. He's going to have fellowship with that man. But whatever happens in the earth is, is, is up to that man. That's why he told that man to subdue the earth. So now when Satan uses this serpent to come up to Adam, and Adam has the authority to subdue it. He could have said, die right now. Well, God can see what's happening, but he can't just step in. He leased it to him. He can't just step in. No, 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 no. Adam's got to deal with this. Whatever Adam does is going to determine what's the, the atmosphere of this planet until the lease is up. What does Adam do? He hands over the lease to Satan. The Bible calls Satan said it to Jesus when he tried to tempt him. He said, all the kingdoms of the world have been delivered to me. And Jesus did not dispute it. It was a temptation. 
which means it was something that Jesus didn't have. The enemy had it. The Bible calls him the little case G, God of this world, Satan. And, of course, we know the Bible says that once Adam sinned, Satan immediately said, you know, past sentence, death passes on all men. And, and all the negative results that come from death. So we're living in a planet where Satan has been in control. And God only comes in when someone who is a part of the planet, a man, asks him to. So he created a covenant between him and man so that he have a right to come on in on behalf of man. If they would operate in obedience, then his blessing could come in. If they pray, then his power would come in. So he's obviously been working in the earth, and this is where you have this battle right now. The kingdom of darkness has covered the earth, but now that Jesus has come and rose again, now that we have a new covenant with God, there was a bright spot that showed up in the midst of this dark world, and it was the kingdom of light. And every time we tell somebody about Jesus and they get saved, the light spreads. And it spreads more, and it spreads more, and it's pushing back the darkness to the day will come where the earth will be uh, filled with the glory of God once again. But in the meantime, the lease is still in place. And, and, and I know some people say, well, God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. He can step in whatever he wants. You're right. He is sovereign. But what you're wrong is, is taking the idea that well, he can just step in and do whatever he wants, whatever he wanted. God in his sovereignty chose to give the lease to Adam. He established rules, and he will not go against his own rules, his own word. Yeah, he's sovereign, but what he did was set this up so that Adam could have authority over a planet, and Adam messed it up. So you can say, well, does God permit this? Does God permit that? Well, he permits evil in the world, but really, who's the one that really did it? You could argue it was Adam who, who opened the door for the devil to do it. Now, let's play a game of true or false. So go with me to Job chapter 1. Don't blame God. Thank God that when this thing is all said and, said and done, we win. Yeah. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. I said we win. Yeah. The enemy will be thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. And boy, you imagine life without the devil. Woo! That's what God intended. And that's what we'll have. And in the meantime, as children of God who love God, who have the word of God, the authority of God, the power of God, if we live according to this word, the devil will be irrelevant in our lives anyway. So what did he attack me? I still won. So what that sickness tried to come? I'm healed. So what that financial troubles tried to come? I'm debt free. So what he came against my family? I'm saved and my house is saved. So what the enemy is, uh, I'm an overcomer, which means that you may come against me, but every time I'm going to defeat you in the name of Jesus. I'm on the winning side. Don't let the world and what you see in the world get you thinking that we're losing. We're not losing. We might be regrouping a little bit, but God's raising up a generation. God's raising up believers that are about to take this thing to a whole nother level. I don't know about you. I'm glad to be a part of it. Oh, glory to God. We're in the biggest fight in the history of the ages, and we're going to be a part of the biggest victory in the history of the ages. Man, if you're not in on this, you need to get in now, today, and don't get taken out by your enemy. Why you side with him. This isn't even part of my message, but I got to go here. Because if you know he hates you, and you know all he wants to do is steal from you, kill from you, or destroy you, why would you then side with, get on his side? Why would you let him use you to steal from others, kill others, send others to hell? 
Why would you think that, that, that you can play out here living in sin? You know, smoking weed. Drinking. Oh, I think it's okay to drink. Yeah. That's not hate and evil, is it? And hate evil means get as far away from it as you can. Not go, well, Jesus sipped a little wine. It's okay to get a little wine. Oh. You're missing all the other scriptures about the dangers of, of, of alcohol. You see, getting quiet in this place. A couple folk might start doing one of these things. Oh, Lord, I'm gonna... Come on. You sleeping around. Cussing. Fleshing out. We talked about on, third, on Wednesday night about, you know, leaving the incredible hawk within. <laughs> Don't let that hawk out on, on people. You know, just doing stuff that as a Christian, you know is wrong. And it's one thing to make a mistake and say, I repent and get up. Thank God for mercy. But it's another thing to just keep living it. And then expect that this, you know, if you ever watch a TV show or a movie where, you know, that the people are about to make a deal with the bad guy. Come on, you ever seen that? I saw some the other day and, and, and they were about to, and this guy made a deal with the bad guy. So short term, it looked like he came out on top. But you know, watching the movie, oh, that was a bad idea. You, you're on pins and needles because you know at any moment now, that dude is about to stab him in the back. He's going to wish he never did that. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever seen that know what I'm talking about? So, so you know, don't make a deal with the bad guy. Criticizing preachers. You know, people make mistakes. And I had a conversation with a friend of mine yesterday, and, and and he was, he was on my side with this. But, you know, one of the things that, man, the Lord won't let me finish my message. Okay. One of the things that, <laughs> that really came up in the conversation was that, you know, he deals with a lot of people that are, you know, really influential in the music industry. And one of the problems he's having and even trying to tell them about God is, you know, because, you know, every time a Christian a preacher messes up, they put it everywhere. You got some musicians messing up. They put it everywhere. And so there's this perception that, you know, Christians and, and ministers and, and, you know, they're all, you know, fake and hypo hypocrites and all this other stuff. And, and I mentioned to him something, and, and he, he agreed with me. You know, the, the world seems to ignore, of course, the 90 to 95 percent of pastors who aren't messing up, whose churches are feeding the poor, whose churches are giving school supply to kids, who's there when people need somebody there because they lost a loved one. All those guys who love God and those women who love God and God's using them mightily. So if someone does mess up, well, not recognize, the Bible said, you should restore them. You ought to recognize it could be you. You don't judge people, you judge actions. I'm not judging you because I said what you did is wrong. That's another lie of the enemy. Well, don't judge me because I said I'm homosexual. I'm not judging you, I'm judging that sin. I have a right to judge what's wrong. Okay? Don't judge folks, keep your mouth off people, and you just live for God. Why would you side with the, with the bad guy and somehow expect to come out on top? Well, you know, when, when, the, when the trumpet sounds, I'll repent real fast. It's going to be too fast for that, baby. I'm sorry. It's the twinkling of an eye. That's the speed of light. Nobody can talk that fast. I mean, I know some folks that can talk fast, but can't nobody talk that fast. And you don't want to be one of those sitting, coming up to Word of Faith. Oh, I, somebody help me. I need the Word. Walk in here and be about 100 of y'all. <laughs> wait, 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 Bishop. Where's, Pat, where, where's everybody at? Oh! Now you're running to get CDs. Now you're running to get, now you're getting all the books. Now you want to get in the Word. But now you got to go through the worst seven years in the history of the world. You could have missed all of that if you just decided, you know what, that's the bad guy. I'm not going over there. <laughs> Let me get back to my message. Come on. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Hurry up. Job chapter 1. Let's play true or false. Number one. God causes natural disasters, famine, hunger, etc., etc. 
false. That sounds right. It sounds false. Job chapter 1. Here's a, a book all about Satan trying to get Job to curse God. And of course, if we were to go over to verse 2, chapter 2 doesn't hurt to do that. Verse 7, you'll notice something. It says, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. So who's the one that made Job sick? Satan. Satan. That's what it said, right? Now, notice in chapter 1, you see Satan attacking Job in other areas. And I want you to notice one of the tools he used. In verse 18, it says, uh, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Notice what happens to them. See, these lips have never touched alcohol, and they never will. Now, you may not be able to have that testimony, but you can get some vert, so you can have a secondary virginity. I don't know why I'm talking about that, but, you know, I'm kind of fed up with all, the, all this seems to be in a church now. Everybody think it's okay to drink, and Christians can drink, and preachers can drink. Some guy got up in the pulpit drinking beer, talking about it's okay. It is not okay. It is sin. And it will harm you. That's why God doesn't want you to sin, because sin opens the door to the bad guy. Look what happens. And behold... There came a great wind from the wilderness. Well, this is a tornado. The word wilderness here means an open field. Why do we see tornadoes in Kansas every year? Because they have open fields. You don't have a lot of trees. You don't have a lot of mountains to slow down the wind. It smote the four corners of the house. It fell upon the young men, and they are dead. I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Satan used a tornado to kill Job's children. Now, if we were to jump ahead to Mark chapter 4, we won't, be, we won't go because for time's sake, we read about Jesus getting in a boat. He's about to go to the other side. On the other side is a man possessed with a legion of demon spirits. This man is not only miserable himself, but the whole area is terrorized. They're in fear, which is Satan's playground. Fear is what called, gives him opportunity to do what he wants to do. He does not want Jesus getting to the other side because he knows that as soon as he does, this guy is going to get set free. And, and, and that guy eventually is going to have an impact on that area. And that guy did. That's a whole other story. So Jesus gets in the boat. He goes to sleep. All of a sudden, this great storm rises up. The Greek word used is epibolo, which refers to a demon spirit. And it starts to, the boat gets filled with water. The disciples wake Jesus up and he has to get up and rebuke the storm. He's rebuking the storm. Is he speaking to the storm or what's behind the storm? He tells, he says, peace be still. And this thing is in it. But Satan used nature to try to kill Jesus. How about Paul? The Lord has dealt with him about going to see Caesar. He, he's, he's in a boat. He, he, he's a, his prisoner. And the Lord warns him that if they leave at this time, it's going to be bad. Now, the Lord warned him, so the Lord's not the one that now does it. He gets in the boat, and it's not too long before all of a sudden there is a Eurachlodon. They named the storm. Sound familiar? Hurricane. They get caught up in this hurricane. They end up getting shipwrecked. God takes a bad situation, makes good out of it, but the devil tried to kill Paul. Every time you see a natural disaster, causing the death of many people, what you are witnessing is a mass murder by the devil. Now, there's another aspect to this, and that is that the Bible teaches us that because sin is in the earth, the earth itself is groaning in pain. And, 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 and sin has been here for so long that it's been, the earth has begun to malfunction. More and more and more. I remember watching an episode of a, a, a last year a TV show, and in the, in the episode, this character uh, came in contact with a chemical weapon. And so it was slowly killing him. So you'd see him, he'd be normal one minute, next minute he lost his memory. Next minute he's okay, but then the next minute he, he, does, you know, he, he, he all of a sudden can't stand up. Next minute he's okay, and as the show goes on, he keeps getting worse and worse and worse. What's happening? His body was breaking down more and more and more, and you were starting to see the results of that. That's also what's going on here in the earth is that the earth is breaking down more and more, is malfunctioning more and more, plates are moving, that's called an earthquake. 
tsunami when it's in the water. All, it's falling apart. And Jesus said, in these days, there will be more hurricanes, more tornadoes, more natural disasters. It's not global warming. It's not your car that did this. <laughs> Amen. It's just not. You don't see any scriptures about global warming in the New Testament, do you? Why, why, since when do we base our lives on something that's not even in the Bible? Right? It's not that, it's sin. God doesn't cause natural disasters. The enemy ultimately is behind natural disasters, famines, and the like. Go with me to John chapter 14. Come on, come on, come on. I got a few minutes and I, don't, I want to use them all. But not more than that. <laughs> Playing true or false. So next time they call some an act of God on television, you, you throw the TV. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> but now you know the truth. When they say, all oh, kids are starving in Africa of God, well, you know, that's not God's doing. That's the devil's doing. God's the one sending Christians over there to give them food. God, good. Good, God. Evil, devil. So don't blame God. Number two, true or false? God causes evil circumstances to teach me something. False. False. God doesn't make you sick, poor, somebody to die, to teach you something. John 14, 26, Jesus says, but the comforter. God's not going to rip you up and then, okay. Which is the what? Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things, all, all. So God's not going to use the Holy Ghost sometimes and something else other times. First John 2 talks about the same thing, that the Holy Spirit, through him being in you, you know all things, and he teaches you. Well, how does he teach us? He teaches us through the Word of God. Amen. Sometimes he'll use men and women to teach us the Word of God, and he teaches us by leading and guiding us. What he doesn't do is cause bad things to happen to you so you can figure something out. You know, Jesus said this in John chapter 16. If we were to go over another chapter or two, he says to the disciples, he says, I've got many more things to say to you. But he knew he was about to leave. He says, but you're not ready for it. So, but the Father will send the Holy Ghost and he will guide you in all truth. That is the Holy Spirit's job is to teach us. That's Bible. Right? That's the B-I-B-L-E. Right? That's pretty simple and clear. I, you've heard Bishop get his illustration before. If you had a parent take a, disease, take a vial of some disease and inject it in their child to teach them a lesson about anything, we would, he would be on the front page of every paper One of the lead stories of every television, every news network. This guy probably couldn't go outside without somebody taking him out. Because we see that as un unbelievably cruel. But then we blame God for that. God does not use Satan's tools to teach you his lessons. To take the position that God is using this negative circumstance to teach me something. Oh, the Lord's just teaching me something through this. He calls it to happen so I can learn something. It's basically saying that what God has done is he has taken the devil and he puts him on his hand and the devil is God's puppet. And, the earth, and God uses the devil to do certain things so that he can teach us something. That's completely contrary to what we've just finished reading in the Word of God. The Bible tells us there are the gates of hell against the kingdom of God. That there's war going on between both parties, not that God is using the devil to bring about uh, uh, some kind of lesson to his children. It's counterintuitive. It doesn't make any sense to take that position. Now, are there times that we learn something while we're in the middle of an attack? Yeah. But God didn't send the attack to you. Frankly, as far as God is concerned, he'd rather you learned it before the attack. I mean, we all agree it's better to learn something when somebody teaches you than to have your head go against the wall and then go, oh, I finally hear you, Lord. So in the middle of something, God will teach you something, but God does not use Satan's tools to teach you his lessons. 
Now, let me give you another one. Then I got something to say that fits both of these. So go with me, if you will, to James chapter 1. You have to understand, tests and trials don't come to teach you something. They come to take you out. And they take out many people. So if they just come to teach you something, how about the folk that die? How about the two-year-old? What was God trying to teach them? That five-month-old. What was God? I mean, how can they be taught anything? They don't even know words yet. Doesn't make any sense. It's just like the rest of the devil's lies. They're stupid. If you just think for a moment, you go, that, that don't even, I, what was I? A man and a man. So was a, he born to be with each other. That don't make no sense. They weren't born. I can look at them and see. Oh, a person gets impregnated and there's a baby. You can see a baby in their stomach through a machine. And then somehow, somehow that we decided it's not a baby, it's a fetus. And it ain't murder, it's abortion. And that made no sense. That was you. That was somebody else that you know. There's, there's no argument here. Oh, see, I'm getting ahead of myself. Here, here's another one. True or false? Now, Pastor, why do you talk about that all the time? Because I'm tired of seeing people's lives destroyed over it. Somebody's got to say the truth and got to say it loud and clear and in love. Because I don't want to see people destroyed over this stuff. Number three, true or false? God causes evil circumstances to develop your character. It's false. Well, that one, oh, that's probably a real controversial one. But let, let me say this. This, like I said, fits both of these. If God sent sickness to you to teach you something or to develop your character, aren't you out of the will of God by, when you go to the doctor to get rid of the sickness? If he sent financial trouble your way to teach you something, or to develop your character, then aren't you wrong to go try to get a job? Come on. If he sent trouble your way to teach you something or develop your character, aren't you wrong to then turn around and go to the many scriptures where God says, I'll deliver you out of trouble and, you know, the just many other scriptures right to the Lord delivered. Aren't you wrong to go to God and ask God to deliver you from it? Because it was God's will. In fact, let's go a step farther. If, if, you, if you don't agree with that, well, then at what point do I know I can't ask God to get out of it? When do I, how do I know I learned a lesson? And it's okay to ask God to heal me now. How do I know my character is where it's supposed to be? And it's okay to say, God, all right, deliver me. It's not scripture. It doesn't make sense. It's just like the devil. You know, he is a dummy. Anybody dumb enough to go against God is a dummy. And he's got some dumb stuff. And we can't fall for that kind of stuff. We've got to understand the truth about things. So James chapter 1, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up here. Y'all still with me? My thing is, what about kids that died then? Did, did something come to them to, to develop their character and they died at six months? They failed? No. James 1, verse 2, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, ah, look at that, the trying of your what? When chest and trials come your way, the enemy is testing your faith. Why? What does he want to do? Destroy it. Right? He wants to destroy it, so you go to hell. He's coming against your faith and to destroy it. And when you read scriptures that talk about how the trying of your faith can end up leading to the glory of God, read the scripture. You'll notice that he's not saying that the trouble it can lead to the glory of God. What will lead to the glory of God is when the trouble comes against you, you stay strong. You keep believing. You keep saying the word of God. You stay with God and you come through that. And that is what God gets glory from. But, you know, the, the, the trouble doesn't develop your character. Doesn't give you character. I mean, here's a stage. Now, if I jump up and down on this stage 
And the stage wasn't designed in the first place to be able to take that. Then when I jump up and down, it's going down. Me jumping up and down on it don't make it stronger. It was strong in the first place. Trouble coming your way don't make you have character. Hopefully you had the character in the first place. Now, it didn't give you patience. However, it will work it out. James 1, 3, knowing this is the trying of your faith, worketh patience. And there's so many scriptures in the Bible, and there's a scripture that talks about how, in fact, there's a lot of scriptures that talk about basically how God will make your trouble work for you. How uh, the enemy will send something against you, and in the middle of that, God will, will work things out and get you the word. Because it's the word that gives you character. And, 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 and the word will develop in you, and, and, and it will develop character in you, and God will take what Satan meant for evil and turn it to good. But God does not have to use Satan. It is not true that there are certain things that God can only teach you in the middle of a test and trial. It's not true. However, let me tell you something that is true. If you read the 23rd Psalm, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right? It says, While I follow the shepherd, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So what? I could be following Jesus and he could lead me into the valley? Well, well, that seems like, you know, he's causing problems. Well, no, no, no. Look at it like this. You're a football coach. You've got a running back. Your goal is for him to get the ball in the end zone. So you call a play. Now, you know that when he gets the ball, there are 11 guys who are going to come to tackle him. Now, you're not the one that's tackling him, but you know they're coming to tackle him. You know he's going to be attacked. So what do you do? You put a fullback in front of him so that fullback kicks a hole through the defense and the guy is able to get in to the end zone. It is true that God will send you on a mission knowing the enemy will attack. But it's also true that even in those situations, God did it knowing that you will win. Glory be to God. Last one. I'm not even going to teach this. Number four, God will make the best of a bad situation. He'll take what was meant for a curse and turn it into a blessing. Come on now. He'll take what was meant for evil and turn it to your good. I remember watching a basketball game. I, I like this one particular uh, Highlight, and you got this, uh, this player's name is Tom Chambers, and this is way back. He went up for a dunk, and there was a guy in the way. His name was Mark Jackson, a believer. And, and, and you know, that would usually stop you. But instead, he put his knee on his shoulder and went higher and banged it. And, and I saw that, and I Lord reminded me of that. That's, you know, that's what's going on. We're rising up in God. And the enemy comes and sends something our way, and God says, all right. You put your knee on the devil and dunk harder on him. <laughs> Woo! Yes, some of us have had some bad things happen, but that's not the end of the story. The Lord is good and his mercy endure forever. And he'll take what Satan meant for evil and he'll turn it to your good. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you, God is not your problem. He is your answer. He's your healer. He's your deliverer. He's your protector. He's the lover of your soul. He gives you peace and joy in trial. He makes a way out of no way. He's your father. Love him. Serve him. Be used by him. Be blessed by him. Experience the future he has for you. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. 